So first I will say, there are a number of community pharmacists that are involved. And I think one of the great things is we are seeing that more and more of these devices are being dispensed at the pharmacy. There's actually a big push to make these all available through the pharmacy because we know that increases access and then patients can ask their pharmacist questions. And so I do think there's tremendous opportunity there. And some pharmacists are counseling their patients on how to use it. Um, and some even are you know, starting to get involved with the data. So that's great to see. Welcome to the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show, where quality measurement leads to better patient outcomes. This show will be your go-to source for all things related to quality improvement and medication use in healthcare. We will hit on trending health topics as they relate to performance measurements and find common ground for payers and practitioners. We will discuss how the Equip platform can help you with your performance goals. And we will also make sure to keep you up to date on pharmacy quality news. Please note that the topics discussed are based on the information available at the date and time of recording. Information or guidelines are updated periodically, and we will always recommend that our listeners research and review any guidelines that are newly published. Buckle up and put your thinking cap on. The Quality Corner Show starts now. Hello, Quality Corner Show listeners. Welcome back to the PQS podcast, where we focus on medication use, quality improvement, and how we can utilize pharmacists to improve patient health outcomes. I'm your host, Nick Dorch, and today we are moving on to another topic related to diabetes management. For today, that topic is continuous glucose monitoring, or CGM. You may already be familiar with this topic. You may have read about it. You might have even seen commercials on TV about it um, and, and commercials that are directed towards not only providers, but also to patients. So we're going to go ahead and jump into today's topic with our guest, and that is Dr. Diana Isaacs. Diana, welcome to the Quality Corner Show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here today. Well, Diana, to get us started, we need to know a little bit about you, your background as a pharmacist, your background in healthcare, and then what you do now. So tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I let's see, I graduated pharmacy school in 2009. So I'm dating myself a little bit from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. I did a residency that was really focused in on ambulatory care at the Philadelphia VA. And then I spent about five years uh, teaching at Chicago State University College of Pharmacy with a practice site at the Heinz VA. And there I was doing a lot of primary, I was in a primary care clinic and doing tons of diabetes management. And that's really where I think I developed expertise in diabetes. I went on to get like my board certification and advanced diabetes management and my CDE credential. And then the opportunity came along at Cleveland Clinic which is where I'm currently at. And the role is an endocrine clinical pharmacy specialist. So it's embedded in our outpatient diabetes center. Uh, but when I got there, I quickly, they had never actually had a clinical pharmacist in the setting before, but I quickly realized there was a huge need for someone with expertise in CGM and diabetes technology because they really weren't maximizing their use of it. And kind of the people that were doing it weren't really like super enthused. It was one more thing to do. So I quickly learned as much as I could about CGM and about insulin pumps and everything. And I was like, yeah, send the patients to me. I can help, I can help. And then before I knew it, I got official titles as the coordinator of the CGM program and the coordinator of the remote monitoring program. And um, now I, I spend most of my time in diabetes technology and I just love it. And I see like a wide variety of different types of people with diabetes. Excellent. Well, Diana, we know you're a diabetes expert. I have to ask, because as you gave the experience, particularly with the Cleveland Clinic, did you consider yourself a technology expert before you came into this? And <laughs> do you consider yourself a technology expert now? Because I feel like that's something that is somewhat specialized to diabetes management when it comes to disease states. Well, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was not one before I came to Cleveland Clinic. I had a passion. I love diabetes. Um, but I, I like to think that I became one, or the, the term I like to use is actually technology champion. So I think every practice needs a technology champion. And that's someone that's just like excited about it and wants to learn about it and can be a resource to everyone else. Because there are, there's like always new things. There's, there, there's just always new things coming and having someone that keeps up on it and then can share that with everyone else. And so I actually think that this is a great role for a pharmacist to take on. Excellent. And that term technology champion, I hope you have that on your business cards or maybe in your email signature. Uh, for me, that's part of what makes this topic interesting. I 
don't provide direct patient care uh, as part of my job, and it's been quite some time since I've done it, but continuous glucose monitoring to me is pretty interesting because it does have a large technology component. So even just as someone that's trying to keep up with the modern world, it's a really exciting topic. And uh, uh, with that, we're getting dangerously close to actually talking about continuous glucose monitoring. So let's go ahead and jump into that. But before we do, we're gonna stop and hear the breakdown. Now it's time for the breakdown. As Quality Corner show host, Nick will ask three main topic questions. Our guests will have a chance to respond and there will be some discussion to summarize the key points. This process will repeat for the second and third questions, which will wrap up the primary content for this recording. After that, expect to end on a closing summary, usually containing a bonus question. Now that we have described the process, let's jump into the questions. Pharmacist Letter is offering continuing education credit for this podcast. Please log into your Pharmacist Letter account and look for the title of this podcast and the list of available CE courses. I'm Nick Dorich, and I do not have any disclosures for the CE content. Our guest today is Dr. Diana Isaacs from the Cleveland Clinic. For the purposes of disclosure, Dr. Isaacs is a speaker for Abbott, Dexcom, and Medtronic. In addition, she is a consultant for LifeScan and Insulin. Diana, we have to begin with our definitions and our general understanding of our topic for today. So what is continuous glucose monitoring and how does a patient utilize this to manage their care? Yeah, so continuous glucose monitoring, or we also call it CGM, actually measures glucose levels every one to five minutes, depending on the device. And then it records that data every five to 15 minutes, depending on the device. So if you do the math there, I mean, every five minutes is actually 288 readings a day. So when you compare that to someone that's doing finger sticks, I mean, we're like lucky when someone brings in a log of once a day, we're like over the moon happy if they're checking three times a day. You could imagine how much more data we have to look at uh, when we have this every five minutes type of data. And it really allows us to see what's happening all throughout the day and all throughout the night with a person's blood glucose levels. So it does work a little bit differently compared to like blood glucose monitoring in that it's actually measuring the glucose in the interstitial fluid. And it does that through a sensor that is placed just like barely under the skin. Uh, so there is like a tiny needle that goes in, it comes right out. And then that sensor is kind of like an eyelash and that's what's under the skin sensing the glucose. And then there is some kind of transmitter over it that actually communicates that glucose number to some type of reader or receiver. Or now many people are just using their smartphones. Uh, many, actually all of the systems now have mobile apps where it can be used on a smartphone. And so someone can see all of their glucose data on that. And then one additional feature is that all the systems now have the ability to actually have low and high glucose alerts. Uh, so that can, you know, someone doesn't have to be looking and checking all the time, but at least they can get alerted when they go high or low. And then depending on the system, some of them even have predictive alerts. If someone is predicted to go, go low, for example, in 20 minutes, it will alert them. So it, it's really exciting uh, where we are with all this technology. So a couple of questions related to this, and you helped explain how it gets inserted. I mean, is this something where just a patient goes in for a, is this even considered an outpatient <laughs> a type of, uh, I don't, it's not even a surgery, I guess, right? Um, what What is that actually like for the patient? Yeah, great question. So patients are doing this themselves. Um, most patients are, you know, they're able to easily kind of insert it themselves. Uh, you know, most of the, there are very easy insertions. It's either a one button click or, you know, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, depending on the device, sometimes they have to do an extra step of attaching the transmitter and some have it all combined into one. So it's pretty to easy to insert. The one exception is there's one on the market that is actually implantable. And it's actually, that is an office procedure. And currently the current version needs to be replaced every three months. So that's an office, um, but that's the only one. All the others are home start. I, typically, I think it's great for someone to be taught the first time how to do it, but then all the subsequent times they can do it on their own. Great. Now, 
a, a couple of other questions. Uh, to me, again, technology champion here. We got to get all the great information from from you on these details. You know, with those apps, and most people are using their their mobile phone, their mini computer that they're walking around with. They can be providing alerts and other details. Question for you as it goes to these kind of apps are. Is that something where that can even be shared, where I'm thinking, you know, if someone does have a medical emergency related to their diabetes, um, something may happen where that alert may not really be good because they may already be incapacitated in some regard. Do those also include ways that that can alert like a primary contact, you know, family member or something else like that that can also uh, identify when that person does need help? Yeah. So that's one of my favorite things about when people have it on their mobile device. Uh, there are sharing apps where it can be shared with loved ones, caregivers, parents, friends, um, and it will. It will actually, they can look at any time to see what the person's glucose levels are, but it will actually alert them about the high and lows. And you can imagine, I mean, that can really be life-saving at times. You know, if someone's not responding, that low alert goes off, you know, they know to, to check on the person. Additionally, the data also can easily be shared with clinics too. When it's on a mobile app, I mean, it can be shared, you know, even if it's on a reader or receiver, it can be downloaded. But the advantage of a mobile app is it's always going to the cloud where it's saved on a like a data management system. Each CGM kind of has their own system, but it's always there. And actually the healthcare team can log in at any time and see that data. And so it is great for remote monitoring. Excellent. Um, now, Diana, I promise we're going to get to how pharmacists play into this. But one final question before we proceed. And when it comes to this monitoring and you know having the, the smartphone, the app, the other parts, there could be a worry or concern that you know this monitoring that could be unavailable to some patients, either both based on you know socioeconomic status may not have a smartphone. Similarly, there may be patients that don't want to use a smartphone or are unwilling to learn a smartphone. Um, are there is this something where it, you know the technology currently it's more typically seen for younger patients or those that are going to be using the technology, or is this something that could be kind of more freely used by? anyone in the population? So it can be freely used by anyone. And it's true, Not although smartphones are becoming more and more common, even amongst my older, much older patients, um, not everyone has one or everyone wants to use one or have it on their phone. So I do like the fact that um, we still have options with most of our CGM systems where people can use it on the reader or the receiver. And while, yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder to share data, it has to be manually downloaded it's still providing those alerts. It's still a great tool. So I do think it's important we still offer that option to people because not everyone um, has a smartphone or wants to utilize their smartphone. Yeah, that's a great uh, item. Glad I asked the question because immediately my mind was going to what about equity and access you know, for this, where that, that could be a real barrier, but it seems that there are other ways to work around that, which is fantastic for patients. All right, well, Diana, I am gonna move us now to our second question, and this does, include pharmacists. I said we were going to get there. I said we were going to talk about pharmacists. So now that we've defined continuous glucose monitoring, how it's done, how are pharmacists actively involved? So someone like yourself, is this something that clinical pharmacists or those embedded within medical systems are typically going to be hands-on with? I, I don't expect that at this point in time that a community pharmacy is necessarily getting that data. I could be wrong. There could be some great innovative work that's being done in that area. But um, you know, how do pharmacists get involved? How do pharmacists look at these results? How do you play an active role with the patient as it relates to the continuous glucose monitoring? So there's so many ways. So first I will say there are a number of community pharmacists that are involved. And I think one of the great things is we are seeing that more and more of these devices are being dispensed at the pharmacy. There's actually a big push to make these all available through the pharmacy because we know that increases access and then patients can ask their pharmacist questions. And so I do think there's tremendous opportunity there. And some pharmacists are counseling their patients on how to use it. Um, and some even are you know, starting to get involved with the data. So that's great to see. In my practice, I am fortunate. I generally have a little bit more time to spend with my patients. And so I am involved in like the whole gamut. So one of my most favorite things to do is introduce people to CGM. And I get to do this all the time, which makes me get like the warm fuzzies every day. I'm like really, really fortunate. But people come to me and some of them have had diabetes for like 20, 30, 40 years, and they've never had CGM. And fortunately, we actually have some samples in our office where I can often just say, hey, you want to go ahead and try it? 
And I can be that person to go ahead and introduce them to it. Uh, we also take advantage of something in the office called professional CGM. And this is this is a little different from personal CGM in that it's owned by the clinic and it's worn by the patient, it's worn by the patient on a short-term basis, generally 10 to 14 days, depending on the device. And so I am involved in putting, placing that on, educating, and then also, when patients come back, I actually interpret that data. And one of the super great things is there's actually billing codes associated with all of these things. So there's a billing code, for example, for the insertion of both professional and personal. There's also billing codes for the interpretation of the data. And I love, like, I love to spend time just going through the data with the patient and asking them you know, how their experience was kind of lining up like things that they ate and their physical activity and stress and see how that impacted their glucose levels. And also with that interpretation, we've been able to take advantage actually of our community pharmacist expertise. So, so there's a billing code associated with it. And one of the sometimes barriers is that that billing code does say it needs to be done by a PA, a nurse practitioner or a physician. But through our collaborative practice agreement, pharmacists are able to do it as long as we get the notes co-signed. So we have actually created a CGM interpretation pool where if providers get these CGM reports, like let's say in between their office visits, a patient is like, hey, can you help me like, you know, help me understand this data or help me make a med adjustment? And we have a bunch of our community pharmacists that actually take turns like manning this pool and provide a response to the provider within 72 hours. Um, and so that's actually generated a lot of revenue for our clinic. And I think just such a great use of our, our community pharmacists. So um, those are just kind of some of the ways quickly that we have pharmacists involved. Well, it's generating revenue for the clinic, which is great. And it's showing the pharmacist value. Um, now, Diana, when it does come to that, what what is ultimately what are you doing you know with that data and having that conversation with the patient is this going to be related to and i think you alluded to it is this going to be looking at changes to you know medication that the patient is taking or maybe change for an insulin product short versus long term acting insulin etc um what from a medication standpoint what changes based on those results uh, but I won't just stop that medication. Does that also lend itself to changes for lifestyle that are not related to medication that you might recommend? Well, I'm glad you asked this. So yes, so through our collaborative practice agreement, we do make medication changes. And so that can include, you know, I mean, sometimes someone's low and we have to decrease, we actually have to de-prescribe. Um, sometimes it could be starting a new medication. In some cases, it's starting insulin, it's adding a medication. We actually have a CGM shared medical appointment where we use professional CGM and we actually have about four to six patients that come in at a time and we place the devices and bring them back after one week. And so what we did was we actually analyzed the results of our program to see the impact on A1C. And what we found is that on average, uh, this was like over 100 and like this was like 180 patients. Uh, the mean A1C drop was 0.8%, which is pretty, you know, pretty significant. And that comes from things like the medication optimization, but also lifestyle. I mean, there's so many lifestyle components that, um, you know, just from understanding. I mean, it's like I could educate someone and say, okay, cereal is going to raise your blood sugar and eggs are not expected to raise your blood sugar. But it's something about like actually wearing the device and then seeing, oh, when I eat cereal, it spikes and eggs, it was really level, that that stays with a person and they they make changes based on that. So it's just, it really is such a powerful behavior change tool. Gotcha, excellent. Well, I yeah, really appreciate that de description. And um, we'll go now to our third question related to continuous glucose monitoring. And for that, I want to talk about benefits and readiness. And you, we we're already discussing some of this about the patient experience and why might this approach might be preferred for a patient, right? More information for the patient could be a good thing, could also be a bad thing. More information isn't always helpful. And for a clinician, how does that help with a patient achieving their goal? So each patient is going to have their own goals for what they want to get out of, um, you know, using device and, and for what they're, how they're managing their medications. 
how do you go about this approach? Uh, you already referenced this as one of your favorite things to do, to teach patients about it. So what is that experience like, Diana? What have been the things that work really well in that education? And maybe what are some things that don't resonate as well with patients when it comes to this education? Well, I have had the experience of somebody wearing the device for three months, you know, it consistently, and coming back with an average glucose of like, I think 370. So the point is here, these devices are not just set it and forget it, and they're not gonna automatically improve the diabetes without some education and some intervention. And for me, the biggest tragedy about that is that the person did not know that their glucose levels were high. And so we need, we need to educate about what the glucose targets are. And especially with CGM, we actually have this new metric called time in range. And that's generally, that's the time spent between 70 and 180. And we're trying to optimize that. And the goal for most people is 70% or more. So I think providing that education is really, really important. So people know what they're monitoring and they know if they're, if they're getting there, if they're on the path to getting there. Now, in terms of who's the best for this, I think that anyone, certainly anyone with type one diabetes, this, is a, this should be the standard of care. And I would also argue that anyone on multiple daily injections, it should be the standard of care. And I think Medicare agrees because they cover it for all Medicare patients on multiple daily injections. I think beyond that, you know, there's there's great data showing it's beneficial for other populations, especially those on a long acting insulin. But I think in terms of, it, it could be that a person doesn't need to wear CGM all the time, right? So it could be like using professional CGM or even occasionally wearing a CGM sensor every every other month or every three months may provide some really, really good data that might be better than just saying, oh, check your fasting glucose every day. Because when someone does that, they're really missing the whole rest of the picture. So I think we're still trying to figure out what is the optimal dose for every person. Um, but I think most people with diabetes benefit, and I do believe it's going to be the standard of care for really everyone in the future. And I think we're gonna start to see that finger sticks are gonna become like urine testing. Like I hope to get to a day where people do not need to draw blood from their fingers because I don't know, it's like painful and icky, right? So um, I hope to at one point get to that day. I, Diana, I've seen enough Star Trek episodes where I, I think that future is going to happen at, at uh, some point. But uh, a couple of quick questions for you as we wrap up the topic. And you had mentioned, you know, type one uh, patients with type one diabetes. We, I haven't asked the question yet, so want to have you confirm continuous glucose monitoring that can be used or should be used for both patients with type one or type two diabetes. Yeah. So you know, insurance plans will vary on who they cover it for. Um, unfortunately, there are a few plans out there that are still only covering for type one, but we are seeing that expand. And I think it's really good that Medicare covers for both type one and type two, um, because a lot of insurance plans follow that criteria. And so we are seeing it expand and we're even starting to see some payers, you know, pay for it for people on less intensive regimens. Excellent. Okay. And then other follow-up question related to this. And in my mind, thinking about continuous glucose monitoring, you'd said patients may use it for three months at a time and then not. The, the question was go, I was going to ask was, is this something that a patient, once they started, are they doing this for the rest of their life? And it doesn't sound like it. If anything, this almost sounds like it's a coaching tool, right? You know, for anyone in real life, you know, let's say as, a, as an example, you play tennis, you may take tennis lessons once a year just to kind of fine tune your game a little bit. It sounds like continuous glucose monitoring can almost serve as that same type of coach. So patients and their healthcare providers can better fine tune the medications, the lifestyle changes. So, you know, is that something where just the question that, that I'm asking, is this something where it's going to be continuous or can patients use this on and off? Well, so I think it can go both ways. And I always tell people they have a choice. So they never, no one has to ever do anything all the time. So I think that's important to know. But I think for people that are people with type 1 diabetes, people on pumps or, or people on multiple daily injections, usually when they start wearing it, they want to continue because 
you know, they worry about going low. Like our insulins are a little unpredictable. Um, and there's so many, you know, like changes in activity. There's so many things that can impact glucose levels that it's really hard to just get rid of all low glucose levels. And so having a tool that can alert someone um, that can be life saving. And so people want that tool. I think when someone is on medications, like on oral medications or on non insulin injectables like GLP 1 agonists, where they're not so worried about lows, I think that's where it truly is more of a coaching tool. And when you get to your targets, then, you know, maybe, okay, take a break and then, you know, come back to it again when, when you need it. In a situation like that, and or in general, are, are the, the sensors, are those being, you know, removed if they're not going to be doing it for a while or, you know, just like any medical device, I figure that there may be, you know, an expiration date or frequency on, you know, when items should be, you know, new, newly done. Do you have, do you, can you share any specifics about that? Yeah. So to remove these, you basically pull them off kind of like a Band-Aid. So it's, you know, people can remove it themselves, although you want to be careful because if you rip it too fast, you could, you know, do some skin damage. Um, but yeah, so it's easily can be removed. Now, if someone has extra sensors, though, you want to be mindful about they, they do have an expiration date. Generally, the, they may be good for six to nine months. Um, so generally, you would not want to pick up if you think you're only going to use one sensor or two sensors, you wouldn't want to go ahead and pick up six sensors or nine sensors. So that becomes important because when they expire, they they do really become they can become less accurate. So uh, that is important. Gotcha. So not something that a patient is going to be buying in bulk uh, to reduce costs. And for these, yeah, you want definitely. them to be accurate. I mean, some do, unfortunately, because it's like you try to load up because you never know if insurance will stop covering it. But yeah, I mean, using expired sensors, it's kind of like using expired insulin. It, it's probably not going to work as as well. Gotcha. All right. Well, Diana, thank you uh, for the information. I I found this really engaging, really informative, and a topic that, again, the technology aspect to me, continuously uh, something to learn about. And it has a really great benefit for for patients. And again, I'd mentioned this. I watch this time of year. I watch a lot of football. Watch a lot of hockey. So I see commercials about this type of pro these types of products being marketed to patients. Patients are aware of it. Providers are aware of it. And it's a great opportunity to really help those patients manage their care, improve their health outcomes and ultimately reduce costs for the healthcare system if we're doing these things effectively. So it's a win-win-win. Every Everybody gets something good out of this. Now, Diana, before we do actually close or wrap up our episode for today, we always have a question for our guests that's not necessarily related to our topic. And we want to talk about quality improvement. That's what we do at PQS. That's what we do on the show. So Diana, from your perspective, have you learned any new skills? Have you further developed any new skill sets during this past year? Well, that's a great question. So I am really, really interested in research and the whole process of, of research. So one of the things I try to take advantage of is whenever I start new programs, I like to assess them. Um, and I think those make really great quality improvement projects as well as, you know, that's research that actually can also be published. So for example, you know, one of the service lines that I have is actually our post-kidney transplant. Um, process. So our, our patients are actually, after they get a kidney, they're only in the hospital for like two days and they're put on these very high doses of prednisone. Um, and so a lot of them already had diabetes or they developed steroid induced diabetes. And so I developed a service where um, I work in conjunction with the kidney transplant clinic. And we have actually a pharmacist in that clinic too, where we I go there um, and they, the patients come there twice a week. So I go there and then now one of our endocrinologists goes there the other day of the week and we adjust their insulin doses. Um, and this is great because prior to this, it was so hard getting these patients into endocrinology for follow-up. Um, so anyway, that was a new service line. And actually this is sort of related because now we're discharging them all on CGM, um, which is making the monitoring so much easier. Uh, but anyway, uh, so one of the quality improvement projects projects is assessing this service. And so I look forward to, you know, being able to share and disseminate those results. Excellent. Yeah, the, the publishing part in the research is certainly very important. And we want to get as many good and best practices out to as many pharmacists as we can. So uh, having pharmacists that are better understanding on research and manuscript writing, uh, that also relates to grant writing, an important part for a lot of uh, what a lot of us do that ultimately, again, goes back to improving patient care. Uh, all right, uh, Diana, final question. Uh, and thanks for your, your rundown. 
again, on continuous glucose monitoring for your notes on the research work that you're doing. I expect that there's going to be folks that have questions for you <laughs> about one or both of those topics. So if someone wants to reach out, wants to hear from you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Where can they find you? Oh, I would love that. So this is an easy question. Yay. Um, so on Instagram or Twitter, I'm Diana M. Isaacs. Uh, you can also email me at Diana M. Isaacs at gmail.com. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. Great. Easy enough. I can say I do follow my with my personal accounts. I do follow Diana on social media going through for these items. So she is one of my uh, personal experts that I look to when it comes to what's the latest or what are the great trends when it does come to diabetes management. To me, it's somewhat kind of amazing in the world that we live in that uh, if you want to find the experts now, you go to Twitter, uh, you know, going through pharmacy school. Diana, you probably had the same experience. We were told not to Google search. Right. And now we're using social media to find the right people. Yeah, it is really funny. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. Well, Diana, thank you again for uh, joining us on today's episode. Really, I really enjoyed the content. I'm sure our listeners will as well. So best wishes for you as we finish out the 2021 year and head into 2022. Uh, I do have a couple of messages for our listening audience to the Quality Corner Show, and that is make sure you subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a question or topic, please let us know. If you've got a topic and you'd like to come on the show and talk about it like Diana did today, we would love that. You can DM us on Twitter at Pharmacy Quality or email us at info at pharmacyquality.com. Now, with that, I again appreciate you listening to the Quality Corner Show. And there is one final message from the PQS team. The Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show has a request for you. Our goal is to spread the word about how quality measurement can help improve health outcomes. And we need your help in sharing this podcast to friends and colleagues in the healthcare industry. We also want you to provide feedback, ask us questions, and suggest health topics you'd like to see covered. If you are a health expert and you want to contribute to the show or even talk on the show, please contact us. You can email info at pharmacyquality.com. Let us know what is on your mind, what we can address, so that you are fully informed. We want you to be able to provide the best care for your patients and members, and we wish all of you listeners out there well.